Dr. Kirti Punamia from Mumbai to please join uh, Professor Khanna to chair uh, this session. And the first presentation is on evidence for revascularization of left main and complex coronary artery disease. I'd like to invite our speaker. Uh, the first presentation is by Dr. Ajay Kirtani. He is the course director of TCT India Next 2016 and the chief academic officer of CIVT director, New York Presbyterian Columbia Cardiac Cath Labs and Columbia University Medical Center at the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Can we have Dr. Ajay Kirtane please for his presentation for the next 10 minutes? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a very strict uh, pressing commitment in time. So I'd request Dr. Kirtane to kindly stick on to the time. Over to you, Dr. Kirtane. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here once again. I just want to uh, thank uh, all the co-organizers and directors for, uh, for setting this up. What we'll do is we'll do these two left main uh, talks first and then have uh, Dr. Stone come up after that. He's still uploading his slides right now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reason to ra uh, revascularize complex coronary artery disease. I'll speak a little bit specifically about left main and give you a preview of what to expect um, at TCT this year. I think the reason it's important to discuss specifically why we need to talk about evidence for revascularization is because of articles like this. This came out in circulation not too long ago and spoke specifically about coronary artery disease as um, clogged pipes, which is the analogy we often use to talk to our patients. But this was a misconceptual model. And I think we just saw an example in the first live case of a patient who had obstructive coronary artery disease, decompensated, and frankly had not had the intervention, would not have survived. And yet, there are articles like this that come out that suggest that when we describe to patients clogged pipes and this being a problem of hemodynamics and flow, that that's mislabeled. And honestly, that needs to be dislodged, and we ought to really just focus on medical therapy instead. Now, I think medical therapy is very important, but particularly for complex lesion subsets, and left main is one of them, it is important to consider revascularization as well. What's striking, and this is data from the United States, but this has also been paralleled not just in the United States, but in other countries as well, is that after the publication of the COURAGE trial in 2006, there have been declines in revascularization as a whole. Uh, PCI on the left and CABBAGE on the right, um, commensurate with the um, ideation that revascularization does not improve outcomes for patients with coronary artery disease that is stable. In interestingly, um, the decline in MI rates has also been there, but not to the same degree as it is for stable angina. So there's this prevailing view out there now that we don't do people benefit by revascularizing coronary artery disease. I think this was best exemplified when seen here. This was a very famous case in the United States. I think you all know that we have very crazy politicians in the United States. He actually now appears to be much saner than our current politicians. But this is George Bush, and he had a procedure where he underwent PCI. This was a PCI that was criticized heavily. There are people who said this is American medicine at its worst. He's the poster child for inappropriate use of stenting. And what's interesting about it is when he was subsequently asked what he thought about this criticism that was applied to his case by people who frankly didn't know anything about it, he responded in a very simplistic way, which is what he's want to do, and said it wasn't their LAD. But this fact that the anatomy can dictate outcomes is something that often gets lost in the conventional way that we currently will have coronary disease parsed out. So when we talk about evidence for revascularization in severe coronary disease, it's important to talk about two aspects. The first is symptoms, and the second is prognosis as a whole. Now, I think from symptom standpoint, there is a prevailing view right now, and if you uh, read the lay press, the thought is, is that based upon this analysis from the COURAGE trial, which showed that at three years there was really no difference between PCI and medical therapy in terms of symptom relief, that there's this prevailing view that PCI or revascularization can improve some symptoms, but the improvement is only modest and it disappears uh, after two to three years. The problem with this construct and the problem with this way of analyzing things is that, number one, it doesn't take into account the fact that this was an intent to treat trial, so therefore patients with more severe symptoms crossed over and had the more effective therapy. And in addition, it doesn't take into account the fact that the durability of the PCI itself was limited by the types of stents that were used, minimal DES use, less than 10 percent in the trial. And this gets to how we ought to construe medicine nowadays. We don't look at patients homogeneously and sort of say that everybody has the same outcome with the use of PCI or revascularization therapies. What we do in the office, in the hospital when we see patients, is we divide them into categories. There are some that are going to have a beneficial um, effect of the therapy shown here in green. There's some that will have a neutral effect, and there's some that will have a random effect or a deleterious effect. 
And what we need to do is focus our therapies on those that are going to have the best effects of the therapy, and that's the genesis of this whole idea of focusing on higher risk patients or patients with more severe coronary anatomy. Now, interestingly, if you look at the data from all of these trials, randomized trials, and I'll show you Courage data as well to support this, among patients with more severe symptoms, there are improvements in, in symptom relief with PCI and even revascularization as a whole relative to medical therapy. So this is the instance of worsening angina in Barry 2D, trial of diabetics randomized to revascularization versus medical therapy. Additionally, new angina was reduced in this trial. And even in Courage, if one looks at this analysis by John Spertus and his colleagues, when you looked at the patients in the trial that had more severe angina, those that were episodes that were occurring um, daily or, or even weekly, these are the ones who ended up crossing over and having the more effective therapy, that is PCI, relative to medical therapy alone. And interestingly, a part of this analysis that doesn't get talked about a lot is that those patients who were in this arm with, or in this group that had more severe angina, but yet did not cross over, had a greater incidence of worsened health status over the follow-up. So what this data shows you is that if you have an asymptomatic patient or a minimally symptomatic patient, sure, it's fine to treat them medically, but if you have more symptomatic patients, then revascularization is going to be associated with increased, uh, improved outcomes in that patient population. Something we don't talk about a lot, but our patients certainly do, is the side effects of medications. All of the antianginals that we prescribe nowadays either have side effects of cost or specifically symptoms. So while it may be fine to discuss using ag aggressive beta blockers in our patients, if you try giving a 50-year-old man beta blockers and asking him how he feels after it, or maybe do the converse and ask somebody when you can take them off beta blockers how they feel about it, they'll often tell you that they've been liberated and they feel much better. And that's an important aspect of, of this. And additionally, an important aspect is the fact that heart outcomes for all of these agents have never really been shown to be improved by the administration of them. Additionally, if you look at trials, this is the River PCI trial that Greg and Giora Weiss led. Um, there's really no benefit to some of these agents, and even if one were to consider the anti-anginal benefit, we're talking about differences on the order of about 30 seconds of extra time on a treadmill. So really modest effects, which don't affect symptomatic patients that well. We know from our randomized data that uh, treatment with revascularization can reduce the need for antianginals. And similarly, if you look at quality of life data from the most complex patient subgroups, this is from syntax, large bumps seen with revascularization, either with surgery or PCI, in the syntax trial. That was true in the overall population, also the left main population, and is paralleled by the improvements seen in the freedom trial. So bottom line is that if you have significant symptoms, or severe disease, the therapy that's going to improve you the most is revascularization over medical therapy. So just in the end, I'll talk to you a little bit about prognosis because there's also a common misperception out there now that revascularization is only to treat symptoms in patients with stable ischemic heart disease. Well, I think there are data showing that for severe anatomy, you can also improve prognosis. And so I'll point out to the simple fact that diagnosing and treating severe coronary heart disease is prognostically important. Um, before I get to the data, I'll show you this slide, and this is taken directly from the U.S. guidelines, which show the prognosis of varying coronary anatomies, and this asterisk, is assuming medical treatment only, is from the guidelines themselves. I did not add that. And if you were to ask, I had a patient last week who's a 55-year-old guy with multivessel disease involving the proximal LAD. If you look at his survival rate, it's very, very poor over the follow-up interval and not something that I would accept if I were his age. Similarly, the European guidelines suggest that if you have a high risk probability of disease, then really it's class one to do cath and class three to do any other type of stress testing because they view it important to diagnose anatomically severe disease. There are a series of observational studies that show that diagnosing and treating anatomically severe disease can be associated with a mortality improvement and a meta-analysis of older trials that show the same, although this has come under criticism stating that there's no uh, evidence for use of statins and even aspirin therapy in some of these trials. Um, there are data from Barry 2D, specifically the highest risk patients, those that had more severe anatomy, which frankly wasn't even that severe, that show reductions in MI with revascularization. There are trials of PCI over medical therapy that show that you can reduce late spontaneous events, although there is an offset with increased paraprocedural MI, which was also seen in the FAME 2 trial, where there was an increase in paraprocedural MI with PCI, but a separation of curves and a reduction in, in non-paraprocedural spontaneous events 
events over the follow-up interval. And then finally, in the highest risk anatomy patients, such as those with depressed ejection fraction, as seen in the STITCH trial, which is a trial of about 1,200 patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, there's actually a mortality benefit to revascularization with bypass surgery compared to uh, medical therapy, with a number needed to treat of only 14 to save one life, and additionally, a host of other secondary outcomes that favor revascularization over medical therapy in this very sick patient population. In the last couple of minutes, briefly about left main disease, this is one area where it's unequivocal that revascularization can improve outcomes relative to medical therapy alone. These are two older randomized trials um, demonstrating benefits with bypass surgery over medical therapy. There's a recent meta-analysis that looked at, at PCI trials as well and basically showed the same thing. Sorry, just going back a second here. Um, uh, showing essentially the same benefits relative to medical therapy in a meta-analysis type of fashion. I don't think you're going to have a, a, another randomized trial of medical therapy versus PCI or any other revascularization in left main disease. But what we do have right now is comparisons of two very different procedures. This is bypass surgery and this could be PCI um, if done in a radial fashion. And so the question is, is are these equivalent or are they dissimilar? Um, I'm not going to review the syntax data in this regard because literally in two months we're going to have results that will help inform our practice in this way. Two randomized trials are going to be presented at TCT, um, one in 1,200 patients in, the Euro in Europe and then one 1,900 patients led by Greg and others um, in multiple countries. And these two trials, Noble and Excel, both separately as well as combined, which will be done in a pre-specified analysis, I think will really help reinvent how we treat these patients with significant left main disease. Um, and stay tuned for those results, which will be coming out at TCT 2016 in Washington, D.C. So I think just to conclude, it's clear that there have been recent challenges to the revascularization hypothesis. There are many who, people who are out there who say there is no evidence for revascularization of stable ischemic heart disease. But I think that there are evidence streams as well as emerging evidence that suggest that um, it is compelling, particularly for patients at high risk. If you take somebody with an obtuse marginal lesion and minimal symptoms, it will be impossible to demonstrate a benefit of revascularization in that patient and potentially you can harm the patient. On the other hand, if you take somebody with left main disease or severe symptoms, I think it's not only intuitive, but there's evidence to support revascularization in that setting. Um, there, this has strong implications when considering diagnostic testing, for instance, in the ischemia trial. That's one of the reasons why the ischemia investigators have a CTA blinded to rule out left main disease. And I think it's really important to stay tuned for important new data regarding the optimal strategy for left main revascularization, which will be coming out at TCT. Um, one final thing just to mention, this week in circulation, um, our, our manuscript on treatment of higher risk patients has come out. It talks about this paradigm as a whole of why we ought to focus on higher risk patients and less on lower risk patients. And so, um, you know, many of the uh, people who were here at this meeting contributed to this, including Greg, um, Manish Parikh, and others. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Keithany. Ladies and gentlemen, please recognize the presence of the course director, Professor Greg Stone. He's the course director.